A little audio technical difficulties, y'all. We're going to sign that back in in a second, y'all. Check, 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 one, two. How are we doing? It? Check. I can hear you. So, yeah, you lost your audio. That's what we couldn't hear. We couldn't hear you. Okay. Okay, you're good now. It was just, it was just <laughs> nonsense anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, I was saying, um, how have you been adjusting to the whole uh, new uh, measures of uh, COVID-19? It is, it is, uh, I, I'm not down there that often. Mm -hmm. um, but the times I, I in uh, September and October, you know, you wear a mask for rehearsal okay. and then you take it off. So it, it, it's, a, it's a hit and miss thing. We've had cast members that has co have come down with it. So um, it, uh, it's not something I want to bring home. Have you, have, you, have you like found that it's altered your, I guess you would say your, your acting style per se, number one with the new measures or? Well, the show has changed so much. I don't know that uh, uh, it's conducive to uh, uh, my acting style. It's it's very, it, it, we've always done it very fast, but mm -hmm. it's it's a different show than it used to be when the when uh, the bells were at the helm. How have you how have you found in a sense like I mean, even on the show forever? How have you found, you know, the changes of daytime? to now and where do you see it going? Uh, I think if, if, if they don't adjust to the narrative and to old time storytelling, um, they're gonna lose, they're continue to lose their audience. So I think it's, it's, um, it, it's like the polls. You can't always watch the polls. You have to speak from your heart and, mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully that that'll catch on um and so it used to be a, a story about families and and uh they used to delve quite deeply into uh issues and they'd have several storylines going at once sometime in, in, in the classic episodes that we saw during the pandemic mm -hmm. they had a, a, a nikki and victor's wedding for example but there True. were like six stories within that episode not just the wedding but, but david uh, kimball yeah they and and now it it's it it's not constructed like that uh, that i can see anyway it's uh, pretty much one thread one theme and uh it's what what other show would they had the masquerade ball okay uh, there again they had several things uh uh going on in in uh one episode and bill would never really end in a climax it would it would blow off it into would, um, several other stories. Okay. So we'd have to speak, but it would then split off uh, into different different story threads that uh, uh, he would then grow on. Uh, the guy was a genius. I, I did a, uh, uh, a little thing on Instagram during the pandemic called the stories behind the stories. And we picked a lot of old clips and you could see how many how many things uh, he had going and how he was uh, tugging at so many heartstrings. And I mean, he just was uh, a fountain of, uh, of those kinds of emotions. And he would pick people that he could actually uh, read their minds. And uh, the people that have been there the longest, like Melody and Eric and Gene and me, he, he knew us inside and out. So he knew what strings to pull and, and uh, it was it was really an incredible place to work for so many years. So tell me, tell me, how, how did you how did you come across getting this role and starting? And was it your first choice? Um, I was. Uh, I, I I had dropped out of school, and I was uh, taking some classes, but not many. And in a taekwondo class that I had. Uh, there were three people because I took it during the day and one was a restaurant manager. Uh, the other was the husband of Victoria Mallory, who was mm -hmm. uh, Leslie Brooks. And um, uh, uh, and I forget the third person, but out of all those 
those things. I got a job at a restaurant instead of driving taxi. Uh, I became friends with them. And as a favor to him, I went to uh, uh, pick her up at the studio and John Conboy, who was then the executive producer, came out, saw me, um, I was introduced to him and I was already studying to be an actor. Um, and uh, like three weeks later, he called me in for an interview. And, and when you, and when, when you, I mean, started in a sense, number one, was it, did you have a plan to get into daytime or was it just something that just landed in your lap? I think it was, it was, um, it was not daytime per se. Uh, it was any acting work that I could find. And uh, it was, um, the, the show was a half hour. It was, it was totally different uh, than it is today. Uh, we shot live on tape the first uh, two seasons I was there. And uh, that's an experience, especially for a newbie. And um, uh, I took uh, my sister and Rick Springfield in on the interview. They stayed in the hall, but as, as moral support. And I thought I blew it. And I got a, a phone call uh, from the um, wardrobe lady on a Sunday saying I worked on, I think it was a Tuesday. And I had no clue. Um, so I, I changed my plans, uh, went to work. And uh, I think they aired something on uh, Twitter and Instagram where they actually showed the, uh, uh, the episode that was my first. And it was with Erica Hope, who was playing Nikki Reed at the time. Okay. And I did the first year with her. And then Melody came in the following year in 1979. In your luxurious career on the show, for you, what would you say for yourself was the most, I mean, I know what my favorite is, but what would you say for you was the most memorable storyline that you were involved in? Um, I have a, a few. Um, one, of course, was uh, Ricky, the one that uh, got me uh, uh, Emmy. But there was uh, Cindy Lake dying, um, uh, there was uh, saving my uh, my father from the mob, and um, my first adult storyline was the Cassandra uh, storyline, which right. was uh, he, he totally transformed Paul from um, uh, being a younger leading man into a leading man. And for you, like, did you ever in that in that time frame ever, you know? this thought to yourself that you may want to, because I know back then a lot of actors who were in daytime tried to make the jump to prime time, but then weren't very successful and ended up either fading out of their career or jumping back into daytime. What made you stay in daytime for so long? Uh, the environment, probably. Uh, the, the first four years, um, I was a little uh, uh, antsy because I thought... Um, you could you could spend your whole life here <laughs> which is pretty much what i ended up doing mm -hmm. but i think i got to a point where um i was married we started a family and uh i thought uh, the bells were fabulous and here you can have a, an entire career and not have to travel or go on location for months at a time or uh, uh and that's exactly, I was, I was there m most of the time. I mean, we did, as you know, public appearances uh, during the heyday, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, we didn't work always five days a week. So I spent a lot of time going to soccer games and uh, with my kids that I wouldn't have been able to do uh, unless, um, uh, you know, you d did a sitcom or something like that. But as the F1 drivers will tell you, you know, they're away from their families from March until December. Uh, they get two week breaks every now and then, but it's, it's a really hard life to be away um, uh, that, that long. Mm -hmm. I mean, for you, like, I mean, I've, 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 I've talked to obviously working in the industry as, as a prime time actor, and I mean, I have so much respect. I always tell, you know, you guys, whether it's Josh or Sharon or you, you know, the pace that you guys go at, the amount of dialogue, 
and script that you guys have to memorize on a you know regular basis. How did you make it feel for yourself like the adjustment? Was it for you hard to pick up on that speed so quickly or something you just get used to? Um, well, both. I think that there are people that are uh, more predisposed to learning quickly. Peter Bergman is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Terry Lester was another one. Um, that, uh, uh, and, and for me, it was always a, uh, a little battle to get, uh, you know, when you're, it was almost easier to have um, 50 pages than, than 20 because you couldn't think about it. You know, you just mm -hmm. looked at it, went into it. In the old days, um, we had cue cards, which were helpful uh, because if you forgot that adjective or the P word or whatever, you could glance down and grab it and, and save a take. But it is, it is a, a skill. And uh, uh, Joshua is a, is a guy that learns very quickly too. Well, I mean, dude, I mean, honestly, I have to say, I, for you, you have been, always been a big inspiration just to me personally, not oh, a friend, but in a sense, number one, as an actor and as a performer, because, you know, watching you all these years and continuing to bring so much life to a character. I mean, there's, I, I can't even pinpoint, you know, uh, one decisive moment that whenever you, whether it was a small scene or whether it was a, you know, a long extended, you know, year out storyline, the level of depth that you would bring this character to life has been so legendary. What, what do you think has made Paul's character connect so much with people all around the world? Uh, I guess it, it, it uh, I'm, uh, I wear my emotions on my sleeve, I guess. And that's, um, uh, it's it's valuable in in the acting world, but it makes it makes real life more difficult because uh, you're so sensitive to uh, feelings and emotions and um, ex experiences and uh, you know it's and especially in times like these, um, that's it, it's it's hard to see uh, the bright side or, uh, but I think those are the qualities that, that Bill found in his, uh, his lifetime characters that he knew that he could count on, you know, those characters opening up their soul and letting you, uh, and letting you see. And that's pretty much, uh, um, I think people react to honesty and truth. And that would be, that would be, I think, would be the reason uh, I, to answer your question is that um, I tried to tell the truth the whole time. So for, I'm sure you've probably had, had this question asked to you before. What would you say the difference is between Paul Williams and Doug Davidson? Uh, Paul is probably more of an adult at this point. Um, uh, and there is a there's a childlike quality that uh, uh, is still truly in in that lives in me. Mm -hmm. um, I could spend uh, years in Disneyland and and <laughs> uh, and, and a, a fantasy world and things like that. And I think Paul is like a grown up. He's uh, you know the chief of police and. Uh, he really doesn't uh, uh, dabble in much of the fantasy. So I'd have to say that would be the greatest difference, would be uh, that uh, there's a little boy still very much alive in me. Hey, keeping a kid inside you is always the best thing, especially in these times, because when life gets so serious, you sometimes have to find that release somewhere else that you can just let that inner child come out every once in a while. Well, yeah, and I, 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 th I think it is important. It, it is weird that, uh, um, that we are um, in a worldwide situation where it's really hard to see the bright side. 
I mean, on so many levels with the, the COVID and the Black Lives Matter and the, uh, the political situation and uh, all those things are, are, are not easy to uh, uh, see through, see through to the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it has definitely been, I mean, things that are happening right now in the world, it just seems like it's a, you know, a, a never ending cycle. Like you wake up every morning and it's always something new that you have to like face and take on and, 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 and try to navigate through. And it's almost to the point where like, you know, I, I feel for us in the business, you know, even for example, like how this has changed our industry so much, people look for us for relief. And right now they can't even really get that relief because productions are just all over the map right now. I think The Young and the Restless is one of the only shows that is up right now. So is what? I think Y&R is one of the only shows that is actually uh, making new episodes right now. I think Days was down and uh, maybe GH is up and, and Bold and Beautiful, but a lot of the nighttime shows are, uh, are down. And uh, uh, my, my daughter's a violinist in London and she would uh, uh, play on the West End and completely gone. None of the musicals, none of the uh, theater is going, uh, I mean, it's, it stopped. It's, Hold on a second. We have a question here for you. Hold on. Okay. Uh, have you ever still been in Paul Williams? Have you ever still been in Paul Williams mode and went home like that? Have you ever <laughs> still been in Paul Williams mode and went home like that? Um, I'm very self-critical, so I usually would have a moment where um, I wish I could have uh, redone something. Um, and there were several uh, storylines where it was difficult to go in and out. So in those times, I would stay at the, um, uh, the studio and just completely uh, uh, immerse myself in what I was doing. It was, it was uh, easier than uh, switching back and forth. Most of the, most of the days are uh, easy to do, but... Um, some of the more emotional moments were, um, oh, they overlap. I have to ask a question because it's always, it's always, it's my favorite storyline of yours. And I actually wish they would actually would have played it on the uh, recast when the, when the show was down. The Cassandra Rowling storyline, the dry ice episode. How did oh, you yeah. guys pull that off? Because that's still to me, like, I, I, I literally play that, that scene over and over again. I don't know how Bill did it, actually. I don't know how he came up with it. Um, I can't tell you how complicated it was. Um, they had, uh, they ran test after test after test, how quickly it melts. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was quite a science experiment to actually make that whole thing. Uh... <laughs> have, you, have you ever, like for yourself, have you ever, you know, gotten the script and, and, and literally, because I know I've, I mean, I've experienced this where you look at a script and you are so mind boggled of like what you're reading where you're like, this just doesn't make no fucking sense, but you still gotta go ahead and do it anyway. How do you find that challenge? That, that is, that is really, really hard for me personally, because I talked about telling the truth. And if it's something that you don't understand or can't get behind, um, it, makes, it makes finding your, your truth that much harder. I have, um, there are some classic, I don't remember that. I wish you would uh, have told me that uh, um, you were gonna ask that because I take, I take pictures of the lines in the scripts that I have the most difficult time with. Okay. And I've saved some classic, classic one. The one that comes to mind right now was uh, about, uh, uh, it was with Sharon and the uh, home for misbegotten women and uh, uh, adopt, adoptive, but it was all crunched into one sentence. And I took a screenshot of it and I just, 
uh, I just recently saw it. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. Please. Because <laughs> I, I, mean, I, always, I always tell Sharon all the time when we speak, and I'm like, because, I mean, sometimes she gets some scripts where I just, I literally, I'm like, you really got to do that? And, and But the thing with her is that, like, she can take chicken salad and turn it into gold. And I'm just like, how can you, with a straight face, and she's like, they can throw nursery rhymes at me, they can throw mother goose rhymes at me, and I'm just gonna come in there and play it like, it's, 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 it's I gotta give my best to it every single time. I have, I have honestly asked her how she does it, um, but you're absolutely right. She is, uh, that is definitely one of her gifts. She can, uh, and she doesn't take it home. Uh, she separates herself. She never takes, uh, uh, there's no stress or pressure uh, with her. She's always in a good mood um, and cheery. And, uh, you know, we could all stand to have a little of that uh, Sharon Case quality. Oh, trust me. I, I, yeah. I, I, if the world was duplicated with a million Sharons, we'd all be in a, a great mood all day long. <laughs> and she's, she's really fun to boot on top of it all. Oh yeah, no, between between her and Josh, who I've traveled with many times to do appearances. And I remember the first time um, she came on an appearance with us and Josh had bet me, he's like, I'm gonna bet you a hundred bucks. He's like, Sharon's such a grandmother. She'll be in bed by nine o'clock and your night's gonna be over. I have the video to prove it was six in the morning and Sharon was still dancing, <laughs> partying, yelling, screaming, hollering, having fun. And I woke I woke Josh up the next day and said, I probably said she was gonna be in bed by nine. She was up till six o'clock in the morning party. And I'm like, I have anyone I've ever traveled with, she's probably my most fun person to do oh, a Absolutely, with. yeah. He's he's pretty funny too. Josh actually. is very very funny too. Yeah, very 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 funny. A very quick wit. So for so for you in the sense number one, like what what was your? Uh, everyone has their you know their journey and their story of how they they got into this crazy business. What led you into this business? Uh, was it your first passion? Your first well, love? Well, I, I I I I have told this story before, but I growing up. And it, I was, I, I grew up in the infancy of, uh, uh, of television where we had um, uh, half hour shows like Combat and Whirly Bird and Rescue Eight. And, uh, and I was fascinated by uh, playing those roles. And I had a, a hat box, like an army helmet and a, 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 a knight in shining armor helmet and uh, uh, a, a fire helmet, and I, I could dress up for all these um, things. I actually put Rescue 8 uh, numbers on the sides of uh, um, my my mom's car, which was a, a Buick, and uh, we drove around town like that. So I was kind of hooked into uh, that fantasy aspect. And, and really, the only place you can do that in real life is is in the movie business. Did you ever did you ever feel I mean in, in these long thirty plus years in daytime of making that jump into film? Um, it was a totally different industry. It's more spread out now because um, we have the advent of cable and streaming, and so there's less definition between. Um, a daytime actor, a nighttime actor, and a film actor. But they were three separate entities um, when, I, when I first started. And uh, it was incredibly hard to make the jump from one to another. And now, well, you know, you've got big movie stars doing television. You've got uh, television stars that uh, uh, are doing movies. I mean, uh, it's, it would be hard to find one that, I mean, Ryan Reynolds started in uh, mm -hmm. television. I mean, I just think about, uh, and then I'll, I would see him on uh, uh, with two guys, a girl in a pizza place or whatever it was. And it, it was pretty obvious then that uh, it, the gifts that would make him so popular 
um, were were very evident at at that time, even though the show didn't uh, go anywhere. But I think it's easier now to to cross over than uh, it, it used to be. Well, that's the thing. I, I for me, when I, I mean, every time I watch you, I always, I mean, I've said this to many people. I've always viewed you as like you know our our, our late friend Christoph Saint John, who was known as the Denzel of daytime. I've always pictured you as the Paul Newman of daytime. <laughs> like okay. you, you've always brought this to me uh, more of a dramatic feel as an actor than a daytime actor. And to me, it's like watching Paul grow over the years, watching you grow over the years. I feel even now, even like, even in the sense of where times have changed, you've only gotten more polished, more fine-tuned, more in touch, not just with the character itself, but bringing an element that, to me, has been lost in daytime for so long where, you know, as you said, with the bells, it was drama. It was, it was what built the show. It was that heavy storyline where you could take a story and it was almost like what I realize now the differences, you know, between daytime then and daytime now, where there it was like, it was a marathon. It wasn't a sprint. Like the no. way that the bells wrote, it was almost like where he'd write a storyline and it would start here. And then a year later, it would all sort of come together, but it wasn't like this rush race where we had to like, like now where it's like, you're putting out scripts, they're putting out storylines, and then all of a sudden the storyline just goes left. And then they're like, two weeks later, it's gone. And it's almost yeah. the point where like they feel the audience is just like stupid where they're like, okay, well, where were you going with that storyline? And then it just, there's no ending to it. And that's where I feel like for you, I've, I've always was surprised that you stayed doing daytime as long as you did. Because I'm like, this is a guy that needs to be in, like, in an HBO or, 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 or a major, you know, prime time element. Because the way that you bring to me storytelling, not just to Paul's character, but just to the way that your approach to acting, what do you feel for you is the reason, like, why you didn't make that jump? And do you still want to make that jump? Well, I guess um, uh, I was supporting a family for, uh, and I think you'd get the same answer from Eric Braden as well. He he signed on to the show. He never even considered doing uh, a daytime uh, television, but um, he wasn't working. Um, he uh, 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 had, a, had a chance to do... Uh, television they said don't do television uh you're gonna make a uh, a movie break but his son christian uh uh was uh, an infant and uh so then he decided to do television and i think he had the same answer with uh um uh when he accepted the role of of victor i think he he tried it out for like six months and it it really you get to do what you do uh, every day. And if you're not happy with it, you get another shot at it tomorrow. And um, so I think uh, when when David Hasselhoff left, uh, I don't think he had any of the entanglements of, uh, of family that that uh, were tying him down. He had an offer for, a, you know, the, the Knight Rider, which uh, dovetailed into the Baywatch thing. Mm -hmm. um, but those those transitions are, uh, are, are difficult sometimes, especially when they tie you down to a contract and uh, it has to time out right. Um, you know, Justin Hartley did it, uh, but he had, that was the, the reason he accepted the, uh, the role in the first place. Mm -hmm. And he put it, it, all his cards in the, uh, that series, but uh, it went from zero to 60 in breakneck speed. 
So he's not looking back. But so many, you know, people step off that cliff and uh, uh, into oblivion. And I don't know. I just, uh, it, uh, the opportunity that I was waiting for never revealed itself. And, um, and I, I got to say for, for most of my career there, um, and all of it with Bill, I mean, sometimes it was frustrating, but most of the time it was really great, really fantastic. Um, you, and I thank you. you I, I yes, want to so thank you for your compliment. That's very touching and, and heartfelt. And I've got to uh, thank your, your listeners or viewers too, because they've been posting some really kind uh, uh, things on, on the little, um, let me ask you a question here. Um, <coughs> um, let's see what question. Here. Someone said today that people ha watching daytime have no attention span, which is the reason why the daytime viewership has gone down. What, what, say the beginning of that one. Someone said that the, the, the attention span now, due to the demographics, has the reason why daytime has gone down due to social media. Uh, I think that, you, you know. I think it would be more about what you said that making the left turn, um, and so if you go down that road and then suddenly something doesn't make sense. Um, you, you get you get disenfranchised with the the show that you're you're watching, and what did I? Oh, I was watching uh, a lot of hits that are on uh, cable or streaming, like mm -hmm. Mr. Robot. Was not fast. Um, uh, the Crown is not fast. Uh, what other thing of uh, the uh, Queen's Gambit is not fast. Mm -hmm. These are really successful um, uh, shows. And I think it's, it comes down to really good storytelling. And if you are, if it's a page turner, it doesn't, it doesn't have to go fast. All you have to do is have a Friday cliffhanger mm -hmm. and Monday resolve. And if you if you're moving your story along and it makes sense, then um, th then I think it's the the medium still has uh, viability. I I will say that there have been huge huge head scratching things where uh, the powers that be make choices that made no in sense. my mind are absolutely totally absurd. No, because that's the thing, like, you, you hit the nail on the head where, like, I remember, you know, the 90s of daytime, especially in on, where not only was it must-see, there was always, like, that Friday cliffhanger where you're like, fuck, I gotta wait till Monday? And now it just seems like there's no cliffhanger. Like, it's just, you wait for something that you think is, and this is what I, what I realized and I don't, maybe you can attest to this. It seems like when certain actors who come on the show, not the veterans, but over the last several years where the new actors come on the show and the audience is sort of, sort of still warming up to him. They're not really sure which way to go with this actor. And then all of a sudden, like, he's getting terrible script after terrible script after terrible script and you. You read the comments, but then all of a sudden, like for six weeks, he starts getting better scripts, better scripts, better scripts, and then he's fired. And I realize it's like as soon as an actor is about to get a good script, I'm like, he's always on the way out the fucking door. Like it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be end of your run, buddy. So like I remember like you know being on the road with Jeff Branson, and I remember asking him when he was on the show. I said, you know when they took you off of contract to reoccurring, I said, you know, how did you feel about that? And he said, me being on that show as contract, to me, he said, unless I'm a, you know, a veteran player there, it's a nightmare. Because he's like, you know, you sort of get pigeonholed 
into the storyline. And then when the storyline goes flat, they got nothing to do with you. So you're just sort of sitting there in the in the back in the shadows and you're getting maybe like one or two days of shooting, but where if you leave and take a hiatus for a while and then you have a reason to come back, it's like they're giving you material for, for the audience to get invested in you. So for me, it's like you've had your hiatus since going off of contract and then you come back, but it's just like, to me, the consistency in the writing and the storylines just don't seem to match up because it's almost like, okay, you expect, you know, you as a player on the show who has so much history on the show where when Paul's coming into a, into a story, you know that, I mean, your storylines used to stretch out for months and you get invested. I think the audience would get invested as a viewer. So, I mean, now do you feel that like, um, daytime soaps, especially even YR, would be better than being on a regular syndicated everyday network and move more into, say, for example, like a Netflix, into a streaming? Um, I, I, think, I think it comes down to, uh, like everything else, it starts, it starts from the, the writing. And um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges for daytime soaps is that there's an hour of television or whatever it is now, 38 minutes of television a day. Um, I know Bill would never tell anybody what his, um, uh, he knew what he was doing in his head and that's where it stayed. Um, but he didn't have a Bible, but I don't know how you could, you could do a show like this without, um, uh, having it plotted out mm -hmm. to some degree. Because I think there are things that, uh, uh, and COVID has made it, uh, granted, it's, it's made it more complicated. But there are things that I, I became very frustrated with because um, either people weren't paying attention or they didn't remember how it was done or how you could do it efficiently or, uh, you know, they they sometimes spend a lot more money saving money than they would just just making the right choices. And I'm not just talking about our show, but there are a lot of shows that are run by corporate entities that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's really middle management gets into trouble when they, uh, they're afraid to say yes or no, or put their, uh, their reputation on the line and Bill, you know, he didn't care. He did what he felt was true. And if they didn't like it, then they can go somewhere else. And he ran like that for years. I don't think he could, he could name the uh, uh, CBS executive if they were standing in front of him. Um, he just was his own, he followed, he was the skipper. He did, he, he would come in, I think he would, uh, and this is in the old days, but he'd listen to uh, these radio talk shows that were on at three in the morning and they'd have call in features. I don't know if they still do that, mm -hmm. but he would listen to, th to that. And he would, I'd sometimes run into him when he would come in in the morning and he would be like really early and he'd have a fistful of notes of uh, things that he had thought of during uh, his time away from the office that he wrote down. And I mean, it was a, it was a 24 seven gig for him. And I don't think that many people are capable of, of doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, on a daytime show that that really is what it takes. And if you have a team and if you have a good team, then it's easier, but it's still, um, it's still such a constant. And then you've got the corporate entity saying you're spending too much or you're doing this or you're doing that. Oh, we can't do that anymore. And so they, uh, you know, and, and COVID has, has played a role. I don't, uh, they led up a, to a wedding and they, the, the groom got COVID and they put somebody else in the place. So yeah, to me, that, that just destroys the whole, the whole wedding. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you, I would I would have had to have changed the wedding to he doesn't show or he's kidnapped or, uh, you know, I mean, something to keep the audience. Yeah, you've got us. You've got. Oh, so that's who that's playing that today. And I, I mean, we did it for a time, but not on something that critical of, of uh, like a wedding. Show. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I, that, that's the thing. And I think that's that's the problem. It's like, you know, which to me, just even as I said, as a viewer, but just on a business standpoint, like being a producer, being a writer as myself, where I'm like, okay, I'm looking at the bigger picture. And when you have such a loyal fan base, like the Y&R fans, which to me, they're some of the craziest fans I've ever seen in my, in my life who are so passionate about the show. And to me, like when you look at all of the other shows per se, number one, on CBS, there's nothing that's been around as long as one, as far as I can remember, with that consistency and that level of, of, of passionate fans, where to me, why they wouldn't be more invested into keeping those fans rather than pushing them away. Because to me, it's like, this is a show that I look at, and I've said for years, it could cross over into primetime if it wanted to and be a primetime show. Because when you look at all the other daytime shows, from the cameras to the, the visual aspect of the look of the show compared to other daytime shows, it feels like you're watching a primetime show. Like it has that element to it. I sent, I sent Laura Lee a, 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 a picture that was taken on the set and it was in our apartment. And um, I couldn't believe how, how beautiful they made the picture. The, mm. the skin tones, the lighting, the, I mean, it looked like a real apartment with a skyline and uh, it was incredible. And I think, I think that the, what happened to Sears? I mean, you know, <laughs> They sold Craftsman. Why would you sell your best tool maker? Mm -hmm. They sold uh, Kenmore. I mean, somebody's making the wrong decisions. I mean, and and, and granted, a lot of it is uh, is financial and caused by financial things. But boy, I don't know that I'd I'd let my my two biggest brands walk out of the store and well, somebody so else's. No, I agree. I 100% I agree. I mean, I, I think that's the problem now I find with just, you know, networks itself, the way the business has changed. I mean, like where you could, especially in the pandemic, it's like you have shows where it's almost where like, like even the newer shows, you get invested into a show and then all of a sudden it's gone. And to me, a lot of times even shows that are even like, you know, where they, they spend millions and millions and millions of dollars promoting a show, promoting a show, promoting a show, and then it airs. And if it doesn't hit that, like, audience market by, like, the second or third episode, they're gone. And to me, it's like, isn't the art of storytelling to take people on a ride, on a journey, not a, a, a fast race of, of just consistent, like, Let's just throw something in your face and hope it works. To me, it's I, like if you're gonna if you're gonna have a show that you're gonna, especially like for example, like you know, Y and R, which to me, as I said, has that element of a prime time feel. You should never, as you say, like throw away your best tools because this is a show that literally could be your bread and butter for another forty years. Well. If you take a step back just a little further and you look at very uh, successful filmmakers like uh, 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 George Lucas, for example, or, mm -hmm. uh, or Steven Spielberg, or um, uh, 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 who's that, the quirky filmmaker? Um, um, I'm blanking on his name. The, the, 
a long time ago in Hollywood. His name is? Oh, Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. All these guys were fans first. So they knew what they were doing because they were so familiar with the genre and the shows that they loved and grew up on. And, and so when they became who they are, it was an, a continuation of, of uh, their passion. Mm -hmm. And I think most of, most of daytime is being run by uh, uh, corporate executives that, uh, you know, they studied communications and, you know, they weren't, I don't think they could sit down and, and make a television show with, without the, the creatives. So a lot of choices that are made um, are not ones that benefit storytelling, but are the bottom line or their bean counting or um, they, don't, they don't get the difference. Would you ever see yourself directing? Um, uh, yeah. I, I think I, I would enjoy that. I enjoy working uh, with actors. And uh, um, I, I, like I said, when I was a kid, I was a fan too. So a lot of the, a lot of the things that I see happen now just don't, don't make sense to me. Um, you know, and it, it, is, it is tough to do it daily, but we did. True. We did you it. And you wouldn't have been lasted this long if you weren't doing something like right. Yeah, we so it's a it's, a, it's a, not a, a mood some subject, but you know we lost a brother, Christoph, who I miss dearly, 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 dearly. The, the last time I had seen him was at the funeral at his memorial. How has that been? That hole now in the halls without him. Um. I miss him every day. Sure. Um, it is incredibly painful for me to talk about because he, he had um, some very difficult personal things happen in his life yep. and it made it very hard to, uh, to overcome. But, you know, he, he was uh, an exceptional human being and he was, um, uh just a f in incredible friend he, to me I, I can't tell you doug how many times that man pulled me out of the gutter how many times he he saved my life when i was going through some of the worst moments that i've ever had to encounter and i always used to say to christoph i'm like you know when it came to i guess you would say answering the phone. Christoph was the worst in the sense of keeping in touch sometimes with people when he would go off on his, his tangents. But he somehow, I always told him, I said, you're like Batman. Because it was like, whenever I was going through something, if I hadn't spoken to him in a week or like two weeks had gone by when we hadn't spoken on the phone, he always knew when to call. He always knew when to be there at that moment. And... For me, it's 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 been such a a struggle, you know, because I as I said, I, I miss him every single day. I think about him all the time, and you know, I I I really wish, you know, even for me, and I knew that number one the demons that he faced, and you know that as well. You just felt so paralyzed. You felt so helpless because there was so much he wanted to do, but it's like, you know, you can't fix a pain like that. You know, you can't fix something so tragic of when he, you know, lost his son. And to me, I've always just sort of said, you know, like somehow, somewhere his light is still shining because it's the only thing that keeps me going every day. And I feel like, you know what, when I watch you and I watch Josh and I watch Sharon, I still carry that peace in my heart watching it through you guys where he's still present. He, uh, there, there are uh, sites on Instagram that uh, I can't look at all the time because it's overwhelming, but um, they, they 
there's one that, that puts up scenes and uh, and his his human videos and uh, things with his dog and uh, and it it's uh, it's just a, a reminder of really what a bright star and I mean that in the human being sense uh, that he was he was uh, uh, quite a guy and there there was a a quote that I read in his memorial show. I think it's posted on my Instagram somewhere, but mm -hmm. it talks about how a, a creative soul like he was is is incredibly sensitive, and a a pinprick is a is a gash to someone like Christoph. So the things that he had to face were even monumental. Looking at it critically, were insurmountable. I mean. The loss of a child is something that I, I can't imagine anyone going through. Oops. The sun is setting. <laughs> I can see I can see that beautiful sun there. Don't have, don't have a game of word word association before that you go here. Think of when you think of just think of the first thing that comes to your head. Uh oh. Eric Brady. Trusted friend. Laura Lee Bell. Trusted friend. Tracy Bregman. Great trusted friend too. They're all, these are, these are all people that uh, uh, at one time or another, just like Christoph did for you, um, uh, picked me up. And hopefully Christian I've LeBlanc. done the same for them. What? Christian LeBlanc. A uh, clown. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> True that. Uh, Melody Thomas Scott. Um, uh, an enigma. She is incredibly sensitive. Uh, she is super, super smart. Um, and uh, she has a knack of saying the right thing that is uh, uh, incredibly helpful, disarming, kind of like Jeannie Cooper did. Uh, that they'll make a suggestion in an oddball way so you can actually hear it. Trisha Cass. Sweetheart. She's another one that's had a pretty tough year. I honestly, I, I even just the dynamic the thing is, I'm, I was always shocked is how they never, Paul and Nina never fully came together as a couple. More of it, I always just felt that there was something there. That was more of a chemistry than than, than I think cricket. There was a there was a writer change, or you know, we had such consistency for like twenty seven years uh, with Bill, and then uh, if you count the executive producers and head writers, I, I bet you were in the double digits in in uh, less less time period, which is which is a tough thing to do. Your biggest inspiration uh, as an actor? Um, that changes. Um, but I think uh, the one that's held on uh, would have been uh, probably Cary Grant and, and Paul Newman, those two. I just said, man, yeah, to me, I'm, 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 all the fans watching, I'm crowning him now, the official. Paul Newman of daytime will be <laughs> Doug Davis's name for the rest of his career. So make sure you hashtag that. Um, <laughs> so for yourself, in the sense number one, like what are you, what are you to me for yourself? Like like, do you have any goals and things that you still feel that you want to attain, not only as an actor but just in the arts itself? I I think that the uh, what I'm going through right now is really. Uh, a rebirth and a lot of those things are uh, um, uh, very painful. Somebody said they're going to the, their sentence at the Juilliard school. Fabulous. Um, and I don't know, uh, my kids are grown. Uh, you know, the show for me isn't what it used to be. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to sort those things out. I honestly can't give you a, a solid answer and pinpoint. Uh, I, I I think that there should be a law where everyone has to learn how to play golf. Because when you get to a certain 
point in your life, you need something that will take up most of the day. <laughs> and, COVID, and COVID definitely has made us all try to, you know, Holy navigate cow. and do anything to stay busy during these times now. Because yeah, it's crazy. It, 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 it's like when you're, when you're so used to a routine like we go through in the business and all of a sudden now you've got all this time on your hands and you're like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Like, yeah. you know, like just even saying, I mean, to me, there's only so many things you can do in a day to stay busy. And I think that's, that's where I'm like, you know what, you know, when I look at the amount of dialogue and script that you guys have, I'm like, yo, this will be the time I actually wish I was on daytime because there's so much reading to do just to keep me busy. Well, and especially if, if it takes you a while to learn them like it did me, it, it, it then fills up the day. So when, when I have a freer schedule, it's <clears throat> when I had like 42 years of something that intense and mm. constant, it is very strange to look at the schedule and say, uh, uh, I've got nothing on the calendar. It makes, and, and I, I can, I'm sure the fans can attest to it, it makes legitimately to me no sense, like none, just because you're the guy to me, number one, that, like, as I said, like, you know. I, other, I really appreciate that, thanks. And you, and Eric, you're, but, but you're, mainly you, man, like you to me have been such a, a core element for just overall, like not just, I mean, like, the happiest day for me, and I remember it when I when I when I gave you a hug after you won your Emmy. To me, it was like it, it was so well overdue, and to me, you should have had multiple times, and that's why for me, I mean, that was my last, probably my last appearance coming to the Emmys because I was like, I was so frustrated, especially even with like Sharon, who puts out so much incredible work. And my good friend Catherine Kelly Lang. Every year I'm watching them get snubbed, and, and it's it's legitimately like I'm and I'm watching them give it to actors either that are not on the show anymore or the show's been canceled. And I'm what just about, like, what what did they have to do? What about Melody? I, I, there's another one I could say. I mean, it, 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 it's 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 to me in the sense number one where where I I look at it where. I was so happy to see that achievement for you, but dude, you don't you don't need a trophy to anybody to prove you're not one of the very best, not just in daytime, but just in this industry for the last forty years. Period. I, it's just, I, it's, I, it's, I, and I I will put your work literally up there with the De Niro's, with the Pacinos, with the with, with 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 the you know the Marlon Brando's of the world because to me. To be able to have that long lasting legacy and to me, you know, as my friend Sherman Augustus, who was our guest last week, he said hello and he, and he said, you know what, I give my, my hat off to Doug. Uh -huh. goes, I had one, I give my hat off to him because he's like, you know what, to be able to hold a consistent legacy of a character for that long and keep people invested year after year after year after year after year. That's no easy task. I mean, you, 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 you look at I, even I, some of the legends that are in the industry that don't have a career that long. I, I truly appreciate it, especially since, uh, you know, what has transpired in the last three years as far as Paul is concerned. And, you know, it wasn't really a goodbye. It was sort of like a tapering off. It was it it it, it, it was a very uh, and continues to be to some degree a a, a difficult uh, transition for me from from doing it every day to uh, uh, not having the choice or um, it it is uh, uh, I can't tell you what that means to my heart to hear you say those things although I think it's a little over the top but no it's I, not I, over the top man. I, I tell you it's when, well deserved it's well deserved I, to I, me it's you know, I, I, I'm not a person that sugarcoats shit. It, it's it's a personal slap in the face in the sense that to not just the fans, but to me personally, just because you have been such an inspiration in my career, in my life, you know, 
legitimately before I got into this business, I worked as a private investigator. I became a PI because of your character. You told me that. And, yes, and, and, and for me, it was, you know, to, to be able to, to be able in the sense, number one, to watch your journey and see the history and see the legacy, it's inspiring. And to know that, number one, that like, the way that, I mean, even when I look at the evolution of, Paul went from having an office, uh, a, 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 an assistant, Lynn, and, and, and a team, to all of a sudden being like where he's running a police station out of a coffee shop. And I'm just like, like, where are you even, like, where is the legacy? Where is the history? Where is the... The thing that brought you guys the show to the number one platform. And to me, what makes the legitimate sense is that where before you had all of these shows, Guiding Lights, you know, One Life to Live, Days of Our Lives, all these different, you know, competitions. And now you're down to like three shows, you know, basically General Hospital, or even four shows, General Hospital. Bold and Beautiful, YNR, and Days of Our Lives. And when you put all of those shows together, it's no disrespect to them, but they just don't have the same legacy, the same history, the same feeling that fans get when they come home every day and they've, they've, they've pretty much grown up, you know, the, 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 of generation after generation. After oh, generation. yeah. They're and completely. to watch, you know, to me, what was done to you, it made my blood crawl just because I'm going, is this how you, and I, and I, and I sometimes feel this way, you know, the, the, the business, we got into it because we love it. But when I look at the way the business is now, where it's almost like, uh, like one of those vice grinders, that it just takes the best talent and throws them into a grinder pit and spits them up and chews them out. But then when their show numbers start to fall, instead of doing the right thing and saying, okay, you know what? Maybe we made a, a mistake here. Well, they, don't do, they, they don't make mistakes in Hollywood. <laughs> clearly, clearly. You know, and, 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 and it just, as I said, to me, I don't. I don't need to speak for the fans. You just deserve better, brother. You just deserve better. I. I appreciate. I appreciate. I. I, I got to tell you that I. They. They have been incredibly supportive and kind and loving, and uh, I've got a, a great family. And and uh, uh, just out of uh, a point of interest, my daughter just m messaged on your uh, on your podcast from London. So uh, where is she? Hold on. Uh, it's, she was uh, Calissa Davidson. It's it's been a few few okay. minutes, but uh, she was uh, just uh, she was watching in uh, oh they're watching in Romania too. So I Romania, and, wow, and okay. a lot of um, um, uh, uh, um, there's a question here: Is YNR having a 40th uh, celebration anniversary? Uh, for me, that would have yeah. been three. It would have been three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I think the show will be uh, forty-seven or forty-eight this year. Well, let's see. So, and I don't. Guys, know. if you have a question here, drop it below. I'm just trying to find some questions here. I uh, I have uh, to warn you that I've I've been given a a ten percent battery. Uh, okay, I won't keep you here. Hold on. But we'll take we'll take a couple questions before we go. Okay. Um, guys, if you have a question here, drop it below for Doug, and we will quickly try to answer a couple questions here. You've got you've got some uh, really really sweet people that uh, watch your podcast. I know. I I I can tell you what I've uh, I've been. Uh, I, I resist mentioning this because uh, what I did find during the pandemic is I did shorts for uh, 
uh, Rick Springfield and then that series. But I also was doing cameos uh, to support the American Cancer Society. And uh, so there, there are things that uh, I've been filling my, my time with that uh, have uh, made up for uh, uh, all the time I've been spending at home, not only due to COVID, but the lack of schedule. Um, we definitely, gotta, definitely gotta when, say, this, when this is over, we got to do an appearance together, man. Yeah, you got to okay. hit the road somewhere. We can, I, we can do a farewell, farewell tour. Uh, hey, I don't want to hear farewell. <laughs> I, I, to me, it's, it, it's, it's rebirth. That's what I'm looking at, rebirth. Let's see what questions we have here. Uh, yeah, what okay. was it like working with Jeannie Cooper? That is... Uh, oh. You know, we mentioned Kristoff. I miss her every day, too. She, uh, she was such a rock uh, and sensitive. And, uh, uh, and she had to wait. You know, her, her, she was a very stylized actress, but, and, and not unlike Melody. But sometimes it takes an audience, or not the audience, the voting, uh, the voting people that do the Emmys to realize they've created this entire image of, Kate Catherine Chancellor and and Nikki Reed Newman and uh, you know it uh, it's it's bigger than life uh, mm -hmm. and she she was bigger than life she was uh, incredible. Uh, do you miss working not working with Stephen Ford as detectives? Um. He was he was he was a kick in the pants and a lot of fun and yes I do I I I think it's been it was before the pandemic so it's been a couple of years since I've seen it but it was at his wedding up uh, uh, in uh, Northern California and he's as funny and uh, uh, and and fun as he ever was so yeah it's I, I do I do that I have a question for you if you could swap characters with anyone on the show, who would you want to play? I always said Kay Chancellor because she had such range in what, what she did. Um, you know, she had the, remember the, the double, the doppelganger that she played? Yes. Mar Mar Marge. 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 Or Marge yeah. or, and uh, I mean, and, it was amusing, and uh, but it was a kick in the pants to watch. So because of that range, um, you know, there's something about Paul that has to be within that the reality range, um, and that's kind of uh, how I approach things. But for her, you know, she could do anything. She could be Mary Poppins. Awesome. Would you ever do a comedy series? I'd love to. It, I would have to be, uh, um, you know, the closest I got to it was uh, fooling around on the nighttime version of The Part Price is Right. Um, and we tried to enter uh, uh, hum humorous elements, but a, a very big aspect uh, of, of my personality is, uh, is uh, surrounds surrounding humor uh, last three questions guy we'll take three more um, whatever is that real liquor you're drinking <laughs> Well, I'm not drinking anything. At the... I, I am. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have to audition for the show when you came on? Uh, yes. It was uh, originally it was um, uh, for a new character. I think they didn't uh, they didn't plan on it lasting 42 years. It just uh, it worked out that way. Last question, guys. Make it a good one, guys. A two-parter. Thanks, you guys, for all your support. And uh, I I'm reading all your 
comments and, and you too they you you were uh of of needed boost today especially uh um having uh, lost penny this week listen man i i, I mean for me I, I know what that loss is i mean I, I don't know if you knew i i had covid last uh march you know, oh. after um it was shortly before greg got it um we were all traveling together it was myself greg Catherine. I ended up two months in the hospital with her. Oh. Um, I have, unfortunately, underlying conditions myself, so it made my situation a lot more volatile, a lot more worse. But, you know, as I said to people, number one, I mean, the, the virus, yes, is real, but the, what I call the scandemic of 2020 of extending this entire lockdown and putting us all out of work and I mean, at some point it has to end. Um, I, I just want people to be safe. And I, but I think that, you know, at, at, at some point, you know, we have to start living our lives again, you know, not, not just being confined to our houses and, 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 and trying to figure out the next, you know, the next situation to deal with. I think that, you know, people need they need entertainment. They need to be able, number one, to find something in these times for all of us, you know, to be able to, you know, bring us together. And I think, you know, if, if there's anything that I've learned myself from not only this pandemic, but even like when Kristoff passed, is that we're not promised tomorrow. And we have to take advantage of every moment and every opportunity that we have in life. And I think that, you know, I think, and I've always said this, sometimes the worst things that happen to us in life can some, sometimes put us on a path to the best things that happen in life. And I think in your situation, you know, as much as it is a letdown and it's frustrating and it is, is, is to me downright disrespectful. Um, I think for you, my man, that this is something in this moment, right now, this situation, the way that things have changed is only going to put you in a path for something even greater that I feel that is left for you to believe your impact, your mark, your legacy that, you know, what you've done in daytime, it can't be duplicated. But I think that right now for you, you know, your wings are about to soar in a, in a, in a, in a completely different direction. But I think it's going to be the point where, you know, you say to yourself, you know, as we talked about in daytime, it's not a it's not a race. It was a marathon. And you, you, you circled the laps and you did your, you know, your 400 relay and, and you handed off your baton. But I think in the end, you'll be the one in that winner circle as you've always done. Because I think, as you said, it's about speaking your truth, telling your truth, finding your truth. And I think for you in the sense number one now is that where the truth for yourself is okay, 2020, when all this shit started, I've said to people over and over again, what is the definition of 2020? Clear vision. You wear, I wear glasses, you wear glasses. The definition of 2020 is clear vision for us to see what's in front of us, see what's behind us, see what's, who's with us, who's supporting us, Am I on the path that I was meant to be on? Am I doing everything that I am supposed to be doing? And most importantly, self-reflection. You know, self-reflection, I think that for you, I think, you know, with this situation, we've all had to adjust and, you know, change for a lot of us, especially in our industry. It's scary because, you know, we're not doing nine to five. I mean, yes, we, if you're on a contract and you're going to a, you know, consistent work, as you said, every single day, but 
art business, as you know, before you get to that 30, 40 plus year career, it's about the hustle. It's about the grind. It's about the, the constant where for us, for example, like as entertainers, and this is where I can, even for example, like many talks that I have with Christoph and, you know, not that I foreshadowed the ending, but when I saw how much pain he was going through and I, and I, you know, he understood me because we both have felt a lot of the same pain. We both have gone through the same low points in life. And for me, you know, when you look at our industry, the majority of people that are in our industry, the biggest battle we have as actors, as entertainers, is within ourselves. Because it's like, when you're working, you know, everything when the bright lights and all the glitz and glam, it's all gravy. But once you go home, you shut that switch off and you're in your confinement of your house. There's no praise. There's no, there's no uh, fanfare. It's just you with your thoughts. And it's for us, it's like, we well, have to be. You got gravy. a cross on. I would, I would, I would assume that it's more than just you. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And, and, and I, and this, this, this cross is, is for me, is, is my symbol where, you know, when people ask me, for example, all the years of like, where did the Teflon come from? And I'm like, when you look at my life story and I say that, you know what, that like, for all the things that have been thrown at me, you know, a lesser man would have been dead. And I, I think for everybody in a sense, they have to find that inner Teflon in themselves when we're going through changes, you know, because again, you know, our business, as you know, it's very unpredictable. You know, one minute you're on a, where you think that everything is, I mean, you, you're, you're thinking everything is, this is a job I'm going to do forever. And this is, this is my life. And I'm going to, I'm going to retire doing this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fade off into black doing this. And then all of a sudden, boom, boom. And you're now trying to figure out, okay, like, you know, the, the, when you start hearing, the, the things that I'm sure we all have heard, you know, growing up in this business, why don't you get a real job? Why don't you get a real job? Like, and we're like, this is all we do. Like, this is the only thing we know how to do. And for us, it's like, if we're not staying creative, we're dead. Like, you're mentally dead. You're, you're emotionally dead. And you got to find that, that balance and, you know, and where you like, okay, you, you can fall back on family. You know, but dude, you're 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 a creator. You are you are a person number one that was not only to me meant to be as an actor, but I think you know you have that ability, just like Sharon. I would say to her, you know, an, an ability to touch lives, change lives, and allow people number one to step out of their own lives. Just as we as, a, as entertainers, it's like, we didn't become actors just because of the fact that, okay, we, we like performing. It was, it was more of an escape from our own lives, not having to deal with the reality, not having to deal with like, you know, the, the pains. And that's whenever I used to see, you know, Christoph, where it was like, you know, he always had that smile. You know, Christoph's smile and that laugh, that infectious laugh that he had, yeah. where you would never know when you went to work or at a party that there was anything going on with Chris no. because he always had that ability to deflect and make sure that everybody else was feeling good and, and feeling, feeling yeah. amazing. And, 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 and I know that you are so respected by your peers for that same quality, that same life, that same energy. And I think, as I said that, you know, this is just another, page in your chapter man like you get the, 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 you, the book's not over yet this is not over this is this to me is just a new a new chapter for you to start writing and i think when it's all said and done a lot of people are going to be eating a lot of crow for the very bad decisions that they've made and that's my two cents on that <laughs> i i put i i really appreciate your words and uh and your 
your the people who watch are incredibly sweet too. Um, so thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate it, man. Thank I'm you so down much. to under under five percent, so I think I'd better say goodbye before. Uh, uh, but uh, God bless you, and God, God bless you, you all. Brother. And stay and safe. Hope to see, see you soon. soon. Love you, man. Love you too. Peace, guys. Thank you, guys, for joining us. Make sure you tune in, subscribe. You can follow Doug Davidson on Instagram at Doug Davidson YR. You can follow me, your host, D Teflon, at, at D T E F L O N. If you guys want to watch this full podcast back, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Join us next Sunday for another hot guest on another edition of Hot Topics Radio TV. Thank you, my man, Doug Davidson. Hi, thank you. Love you. Peace, Love guys. You too.